Welcome, one and all, to the final uh, map reduce stream. Well, I mean, I'm going to keep going till it's done, but if I say it's final, it'll be final, right? I bloody hope so. I bloody hope it doesn't go beyond today. I'm done with it. So done with it. You will notice I am back on Windows. Still on Windows. Don't know what to say, to be honest. I got into a six hour, six hour battle yesterday from three to nine, trying to sort out the uh, problem that we had last time with the Unix socket not working on Windows, causing the entire program to just not work at all. 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. I was fixing that and I uh, don't know how bothered I can be to rant about all the things that went wrong. But um, yeah, there's been a, many, many, many things have changed. 18, a solid 18 um, pending changes on GitHub should tell you everything you need to know and none of them is actually a project file. So I'll explain what the fuck has happened here. Um, so basically, you know, I try to install Linux. At least I set off on the path of installing Linux at 3 p.m. yesterday. Spent like 10, 20 minutes reading about the distributions, you know, choosing one. Download Ubuntu, 2 gigabytes. Um, and then I download Rufus as well, the removable media, removable disk creation tool. Um, and then I realized, well, how am I going to stream from Linux? It's probably a lot harder than on Windows, and of course, Streamlabs is not on Linux. Shout out to Streamlabs, not on Linux. So of course we put, we put the feature request in, Linux plus, I mean, whatever. So I decided to try to stick to Windows. Worst case, I would switch everything to Linux, but that would require reconfiguring the whole streaming setup, so I decided against it, right? Um, so I'm out reading about Unix sockets, and apparently the latest window, version of Windows 10, the April 2018 update, implements Unix sockets. So I was like, praise Jesus, I am saved. I can, I can just update Windows. So all those, you know, control, um, all, all of the... Um, all, all of the times that I'd forcibly shut down Windows Update, I just came crawling, crawling back to it like a bitch, like, help, need update. Install, install this update, it takes like an hour, of course. You know, when you're watching Windows Update, somebody said on the internet, it's kind of like watching a historical tragedy. You just, you just know something's going to go wrong at some point. Um... <laughs> Nothing did go wrong, actually. It just took an hour or so. I do can't remember. And then I jump into Linux, and this is what happens. Right? Git bash. Um, dot. I do the usual initialization. And then I do the test, right? Go. Test. Um, run parallel. Check it. Give it a moment. Is it always this low the first time around? Fuck no. Anyway, check it out. Um, yeah, line broke it a bit badly, sorry. But yeah, you can see here. You know, the same warnings were thrown that were thrown last time. But then it just goes, bind, not supported by Windows. And I flick through Unix, Unix sockets on Windows, and it turns out it, they have a list of features they couldn't be bothered to implement, and this is one of them. So thanks thanks for nothing, Windows. I got a bit further, and then it broke again. Fucking piece of shit. I'll tell you what. Max and Ben, you know, I checked out what they were doing, because I, I, I wouldn't have thought they had been on Linux as well, but then I took a look, and they were on Mac. And, uh, oh, Mac OS, of course, is based on Unix in it. 
So it's going to support Unix sockets. Windows is really the only, I think, popular operating system that's not based on Unix, even among the mobile ones. I think all of them are based on Unix. Um, so Windows is the same thing, Winsock or whatever. Nightmare. Um, so did some Googling and found Windows subsystem for Linux, which should really be called Linux subsystem for Windows. It's a Linux emulator. Installed that and then three hours of like horror trying to get it to work. Um, <laughs> the first thing you'll notice is uh, we have Ubuntu here listed as the <laughs> as the terminal. It looks a bit different from what it did last time. And you know, there's a tilde here. I can do like uh, ls to show you the, the directory. It has like nothing in it. Some random sim links that I tried to make. I don't know what a sim link is. It's like a link. But like, you know, if I go to the root, it literally is the root. Right, it's it's Ubuntu. I literally installed Ubuntu via an emulator. Um, and then I can, I can only get to, you know, this tilde folder has nothing in it. That's the user folder. Um, how do I get to the user folder? It's like, uh, it's in home, right? So slash and then home and then this user folder. Whereas if I want to access anything on the C drive, because this is all virtualized in like app data or somewhere on Windows, and you're not even allowed to edit things in Windows or it breaks Linux, it like deadlocks it with like file permissions errors. It's ridiculous. According to the documentation, this is an extremely hackish emulator. Um, so I can get I can get back to the C drive by going to um, mount, right, and then mount has oh it only has the C drive on it but yeah you can by do by clicking on setting the directory CD don't forget changes directory the working directory which is this thing um, double dot means go back till there's home directory and slash is root directory. So when I set cd slash, uh, I will set it to the root directory. And um, what's the other thing? ls lists everything that's in that folder. You can also use lsr to do a recursive list. Not recommended on the entire C drive. <sighs> but yeah, um, I can set the directory to my distributed systems folder by using the sim link which is called ds, and that sets it to the, the correct folder, right? So it looks very much like our current folder. If I want to use bash, I set it. I set that up, by the way. Settings.json, you can set different integrated terminals if you take a look at these. Um, you know, uh, Windows and Linux, I mean, this is actually just a hack. If I want to load bash, then I have to make this some like invalid string like wins. And then I do control shift prime to load the new console and bang, I'm on bash. So I can use both the Ubuntu and the bash console. I mean, both of them are bash. Uh, Ubuntu is the emulated Linux operating system and bash is um, git bash for Windows as it was before. That's what we were using before. And now I have to set it back to Windows so that the problem goes away. Don't problem. <laughs> Don't problem. And also I set GoPath here to the correct thing, you know, DS. And I also added the original GoPath, which is where some of the like Visual Studio tools are set. Because when I just set it to this, the tools all disappeared and then I had to Google how to add that back in. So anyway, that's how you set GoPath. That means that .env is completely useless. There was no need for that ever. <laughs> Running the Linux subsystem, nothing was working. You know, it seemed like it, the, the entire thing was just fated to not work. But then I realized, like, I wasn't able to run a single shell script. But then I realized, um, I realized why that was as well. Uh, it was, of course, well, I'll show you. So look at this, init .sh which is the thing I was using to load the um, project into the console so I could run tests and shit. Take a look at this. It didn't change, but it did change. Why is that? 
Well, answer. So I, I called it. Do you remember when we had that? It was testing the um, part two solution and there were word counts coming up and they didn't agree even though they were visually identical. It was just the line endings that were different. I didn't call it this time. It was fucked. I had no idea why. It kept saying cannot find directory and the reason was because carriage return was secretly on the end of the directory. So I switched it. I switched it to LF because some guy on the internet was like, my first instinct is that this is what you did wrong. And I just, when I saw that, I just knew, like, yeah, it's something everyone needs to know about LF and CRLF. It's absolutely diabolical. It's the same reason we have QWERTY still instead of something like Colmac. Um, you know, you can set the format of the file, the end of line character, the character that signifies a new line. The convention is different. It's messed up. Uh, of course, because it's a proper like Linux bash, I had to like deal with the fact that my um, DS folder is in my user folder, which has a fucking space in it. That was fun. You know, if you put the tilde in the space, it fucks everything up. If you don't, you, you're supposed to put the tilde just around the space itself, pretty much. Well, I, I, I wrote it like this. This is my name in quotes. And then I, you know, I did the rest of the. I did the rest of the address the same way on either side. So this side as well. I was like. And on Linux, there's no colon. There's a slash at the beginning. Well, yeah. I, mean, I guess I have more or less gone into that rant that I was talking about, just trying to fix everything. That isn't even everything that I did fix. So many things have changed this. So I did, for started okay, I deleted launch.json because debugging was useless, and so I decided to just do without it. Deleted .n because it turned out it did nothing. I thought that this had fixed those problems that we had with um, these files going, cannot find package, disk v, cannot find package, lock service, and all that. But then I figured out what that was as well. And it turned out what I thought had fixed it didn't fix it at all. It just didn't, the error didn't show because it didn't click the right place, literally. So what's happened? Well, I did some Googling. I Googled like MIT distributed systems disk v and it turned out it turns out this is a legacy a legacy project so these are all legacy projects disk v lock service pb service and view service legacy projects things that you can see here if you want uh you have to scroll back as far as 2015 2016 the current set of projects was implemented you know raft and like the sharded key value store and the stuff that we're doing right now, 2016, 2015, you can see the original projects. There were five of them for some reason. Map produces the same pretty much. Whatever this is, this is not rough. I think it's based on Paxos. Paxos, yeah. So Lab3 uses Paxos. We don't use Paxos anymore. If I look up Raft, it's not there. So you see what I mean. Um, if I type in service, just service. Um, it'll match those words, right? View service and those words that were all missing packages. Here it is, view service in the source folder, which is not there anymore. So no wonder it was throwing, cannot find this shit error. Because the guy who maintains this project deleted the um, projects themselves, but didn't delete the, like, whatever these are, the sort of test files from the main folder. These ones, these five files here, what? So I, I took the pleasure, pleasure of, I didn't delete them, I, I chucked them in the scrap legacy folder and put an underscore so that the uh, problem detector shuts up about them pretty much. No longer are we going to get missing package errors. You know, I can't, I can't believe the guy, like it takes a level of fecklessness to not just go through the coursework that you're setting to hundreds of students and not check that you've not left things in that are going to cause that kind of problem. You know, it's not a serious problem because this code is never gonna was never gonna run, but at the same time it throws problems. And if you're debugging something else, you can easily think there's a problem when there isn't one. So for me, I was getting missing package errors because I was running tests in the main folder by accident, whereas I was, you know, you, we've been running tests in MapReduce in the MapReduce folder. 
Uh, sorry, where am I? In the MapReduce folder, we've been running tests. But I set the directory to main and ran tests and got like all the audio packages are missing. What was supposed to happen in that situation, by the way? Um, so I should, yeah, I should uh, do the um, dot init dot sh to initialize GoPath. GoPath, of course, has to be set separately in Visual Studio Code and all of the terminals individually. Because, of course. Um, so if I go cd into main, into the main folder, see it's switched from src map produced to src main. Go test run like, I don't know, parallel. The kinds of things I was trying to do by accident. It should just say, um, well, actually, it is. See, it is still throwing errors, but it's not throwing the same errors. These errors that are being thrown now are quite. I looked into those as well. I'll fix them now, just for you guys. Um, it's literally just again, you know, name collisions and things, just from having separate files that are not supposed to be used at the same time. So what I'm going to do is literally all the problems are going to be solved by just. Um, making this, you know, ignoring this file. And uh, all the problems are going to continue to show until I restart the folder, unfortunately. So I'm just going to do that. I tried to, you know, I moved the DS, the whole folder into just the C drive to try to get around Linux's problems, but it seemed to be OK. Ah, oh, shit. Now, now that I've restarted the folder, I have to restart both the terminals, don't I? Oh, shit, yeah. Sorry, guys. I'll do that quickly, because I know how to do it. I just, like, don't forget, fuck this up by putting a random character and load the new terminal and then set it back to what it was. And I have to run init.sh on both the terminals so that they're both... Uh... Oh yeah, this one I first have to cd into my actual um, distributed systems link, and then I can dot in it because it starts at the Linux home folder. Um, so yeah, what happens now if I do the same thing I just did? Cd main, go test run parallel. Yeah, can't load package. Cannot find package. Oh fuck's sake! Sorry. Go test run is a um, switch, and parallel is the name of the test. Check it out. No test files. That's what's supposed to happen. So. Yeah, that's my rant against MIT guy, the guy who set up the project for being a bit, I mean, feckless, literally feckless. That's what I would describe that as. Um, if you look at the main folder now, I've removed all those files. So this this is the MapReduce inverted index, the optional project that, were, in principle, I might end up doing, but not for the time being. I'm going to move on to, to Raft. You know, this is your code here, part five, map produce. Yeah. Um, I've commented that out, so it's not being noticed. WC is the word count example that we were working on, of course. It has a map, you know, a map F and a reduce F. What the hell is this? Composite literal uses unkeyed fields. That's a warning, but I mean, this is the key and this is the, oh, sorry, this is the key and this is the value. So that's, who cares? Um, you know, these are tests. This is the test for an inverted index, I guess. Um, this is the test for the entire map produced library. See, part one, it runs the sequential test. Um, part two, it runs the shell script that we were testing part two with. Then we test parallel, and part four is going to test failure. Part five is also here in case we just want to test uh, the inverted index, but uh, I'll, I'll do that later. Later on, you know, after after we've done part project two, raft, maybe projects three and four. I don't know. At some point, I could, could get back to inverted index, but for the time being, I'm happy to move on. Um, yeah, then this test word count, of course, we've used that before, and also all of these have been modified, of course. These files have all been modified, but they haven't because it, all I've done is converted the line ending to LF, the Linux line ending, just to make sure that they load correctly. Of course, doing usually when you're working in Windows, you want to use CRLF. LF is only for 
compatibility with the Linux uh, subsystem, the emulator. CRLF is useful just because Notepad is stupid, and if you if you load something with LF in Notepad, it's going to look like this. Um, So yeah, it ignores the line endings. You know, here there is a new line character. I can prove that to you guys by uh, what? Watch this, right? So I'm, I'm uh, seeking through the characters. Left, 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 left. So it double left it as it skipped the line ending. I mean, yeah. So that's Windows's fault, obviously. It's Windows's fault for using such a stupid convention and. Not implementing it in Notepad that it recognizes line breaks correctly is just really bad. It's amazing these kinds of things. It's just kind of past incompetences that stack up. Um, but that's just you know I don't want to be too much of an idealist. That's just how life is when it comes to people. You know people people try their best at the time, and um, a lot of things you know that should be fixed are never fixed. Uh, for reasons of how the system works, I guess. But anyway, that's all done, right? So I, now I have 20, 20 changes to commit to GitHub here um, to fix all of the stuff that went wrong. Um, and so I will do that now just to um, set myself up to continue the rest of the project. Um, uh, so yeah, I think I've gone through all of the things that have changed in the in the six hour war that I waged yesterday. Got rid of dot end, didn't need it. In it was changed to lf, as were the rest of these shell scripts. Um, I well, I removed these five source files from the legacy project and chucked them into scrap legacy from the legacy project uh, with an underscore so that the um, they don't get detected by the uh, um, codes thing, what do I mean, the static analyzer of code, I guess I should call it that. Um, there are six actually, these six, right, so this is the first one and the, these are the other, the next four and this is one. Uh, this, uh, yeah, I just commented out because it, it has name collisions with other things in MapReduce, so I can comment it back in if I want to work on um, the rest of MapReduce. You can comment out WC which is what it collides with, the word count file. Um, so that, that explains those two changes, one, those three, these, those two, this one, the legacy files, and yeah, launch I ditched as well because I decided debugging just doesn't work. So at the end of uh, session six, fixed environment is what I'm going to say. Because all of this stuff, none of it is the code. None of it is what I was supposed to spend all time working on. I'm just setting myself up to be able to work. Um, with a bit of experience, I now know what to do. And I'll save all that onto GitHub. Bang. <sighs> Feels good, man. God, that was messed up. It, it is a shame that you know it takes this much effort to configure stuff. But um, yeah, that's just how it is sometimes. I guess in in life and coding stuff where you know lots of different people make lots of different tools and they all have to get along nicely. So now yeah, you can see how nothing is colored in, everything is nice. Well, the only thing is that it's complaining to me about WC because composite literal uses on keyed fields. I don't don't know what makes this a composite literal as such. Perhaps because I'm using words rather than a string literal. Maybe that's why it's saying composite literal, but such a minor error. I don't think I can ignore errors, unfortunately. Um, but never mind. I'm happy. I'm happy to just leave that warning there for the time being. It'll go away when I restart the. Um, the folder again, but I'm not going to do that because I have the two terminals. So why? Yeah, another thing. Why do I have both of these terminals? I have the Linux emulator, but not the. Um, why do I still have Git Bash for Windows? Well, I'll show you now. Let's just clear the two terminals. Of course, if I um, 
So if I run the, t oh yeah, I, I should say another thing. I learned go test run. What the run switch does, I read, I've read now during my six hour war. Whoops. Um, what, 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 what run does is it runs test by the first bit of the name using some sort of regex matching, you know, text matching. But so all the tests that start with the word test and then parallel get run by run and then parallel. But it's everything after the word test. So if I just, I guess if I clear this, then it will run all the tests, all six of them. Um, but I can also just do this because that will still, the two parallel tests are the only ones starting with the letter P, so this will still work. Um, and I can show you by, well, by running that. First I'll run, run it in bash. So um, this is, this is, uh, shit, this is in main, sorry. CD slash map produce. Uh, yeah, so um, go test run uh, P. This is where we were before, right? And binds not supported by Windows. On Ubuntu, go test run p. First of all, notice how long it's taken. <sighs> well, okay, particularly the first run is going to take ages. But also, look, it's working, sort of. I'm finally at the point where I can test my actual work after all that. Um, and as you can see, what's happening in the test here is that... Um, uh, well, it's basically all working except it deadlocks at the end. So, you know, all the tasks have completed, but it hasn't returned. So what I said about unreachable code, I guess, turned out to be right, if you remember the warning from, from the previous uh, session, from session five. Um, yeah. So I, I, can get, I can get to work. But to answer the question of why... So I had to fail the test manually by pressing Control C because it was taking too long. Um, why am I still running Bash? Well, the reason is you know I'm I'm on Ubuntu. I do go test run the sequential tests for which test part one. Okay, run yeah, run is the switch. So again, I can just type in S. I can type in SEQ. Just mat has to match those tests uh, that I want it to, and nothing clashes with sec except sequential. Look at this. It's working. Oh, it only took 4.4 seconds. Oh, interesting. Let me try that again. Yeah, only took 4.5 seconds on bash. Again, I keep typing this wrong run and this, because S looks more like a command line switch because it's just one letter. It's faster. Bash is faster. As in Windows, bash is faster. Well, obviously, if you're not running, so if you, whenever you run something through an emulator, you know, if you think of, uh, well, any emulator, it's always going to be a lot more clock cycles on the host computer is sort of required to pull off one thing in the thing that you're emulating. Particularly if you've looked at, like, the really accurate SNES emulator, for example, which requires, like, 3 gigahertz because of the amount of cycles that are required to perfectly emulate a single cycle in the original SNES. But yeah, when I was testing yesterday, this uh, was taking four seconds on Windows Bash and it was taking eight seconds on Ubuntu. So I, I can switch to Windows Bash um, whenever I want to test something that doesn't rely on RPC concurrency, the actual distributed stuff. So when I, whenever I want to do a sequential test of, of anything, I can switch back to the Bash terminal. But for now, Ubuntu is default. Um, I want to say about Ubuntu, um, you know, I have no idea if this is going to hold up because there are definitely compatibility problems. Um, like I tried to, I try, I try to install Go just using the package manager and it totally failed. Like it, it tried to install an old version and then it failed somehow. Didn't even manage the old version. So I installed Go using Go's website instead. Um, 
following the instructions, and that seems to have worked. Oh yeah, I do now have you know I have a Linux Go and a Windows Go, both taking up 0.3 gigabytes of hard drive space. But you got to do what you got to do. Okay, to summarize, after half an hour of basically explaining where I am now after all that stuff that happened, um, I'm ready to continue. I am at the same place I was at the end of session five, so it's kind of like we can imagine I'm just picking up from there, but I fixed all the stuff that was uh, not allowing me to test my stuff. So half an hour of speech today, six hours of, you know, battle uh, yesterday from 3 to 9 p.m. and from whenever I was streaming it was like 12.30 to 2.30 or something um, no it was 12.30 to 1.30 something like that it was only an hour and a bit uh, that was me trying to debug find out what was causing the initial problem live on stream uh, so it's as if we have just picked up from the end of session 5 which happens two days ago now, so I definitely feel like I stagnated quite hard, considering the pace I was going at before then. And that's also why I'm super keen to finish the rest of it today. Part 3 and 4. Part 5, the optional part, I can... Uh, oh, it's coming after Project 2, basically, so I'm taking a break after this. Whoa. So, we know what we're doing. We've got it working. Everything is testable. Let me just uh, clear the... Um, temporary files that just got created in MapReduce. Um, these ones are, there are, there's no need to clear these because they're being used to test them. Um, you know what? Um, what? What am I talking about? Those files are being used to test part three, which is what we're going to be actively testing, but I'm going to I demo tested uh, part one, and so I'm going to delete all those temporary files with this shit. Actually, now that I think about it, these are also just coming from the part three test, aren't they? So, uh, yeah, again, it's you know the fault of the guy who designed the project that these are not in a separate subdirectory. Uh, it's my fault that these are not in a separate subdirectory. But it doesn't really add complication. It's such a minor thing to learn to use folders in a program, and it just saves you a lot of uh, disgusting temporary files that you have to keep clearing out. All right. Anyway, um, computer's just casually started to overheat again, quite hard. Let me just have a look at it to see what's going on. Um, Android debug bridge that should be on. I don't know what this is still. Just having a look at what's going on. Yeah, the thermals are still awful. Um, maybe for the next project I will undervolt the computer slightly more so I, you can reduce the voltage across the um, CPU and the GPU. Uh, as long as it's enough of a voltage for it to maintain the designated clock speed, which you can basically see it can do still. It's supposed to be tested for a few hours, but yeah. If it can do that, then you can reduce the voltage safely, and all that you lose is heat. It's uh, quite a useful thing to be to know how to do. So these are the reduced voltages. These three. I don't know about this one. I didn't look into that. But they can come down a bit further. Put minus point one is like the aim. I think can't really go much further than that. Uh, yeah. God, it's so hot. This laptop is just fire. But never mind. I can just leave it on my lap and get on with my work. <sighs> okay, um, is there anything else that I want to say before I start? So I'm going to start on my aim to fix, fix shit and just finish the entire project. So don't forget, all that we are editing is the schedule down here. Um, and I have nothing, nothing left to say. I think on on the other front, we're continuing off the end of project five. Sorry, off stream five. Five. I do, I do want to. I do want to give a quick shout out. The uh, the a, a guy I whose whose Facebook profile I looked at 
a few days ago, uh, Declan Core. He's um he's a um uh, studied medicine at Cambridge, um and um his uh, Facebook profile was basically like a third posting about you know junior doctor rants and which I don't want to disparage junior doctor rants they're pretty important and completely valid um but yeah a third of it was that a third of it he's posting about like uh, orchestrating student theater productions the ADC and the last third he's just posting about his eternal struggles the fights with windows the battles of like so I installed Sibelius and it like deleted the kernel driver or something <laughs> something like that um, just levels and you know I, I my, my heart reaches out to him if, when you when you're in a battle a six hour battle with windows it's, it's like a rite of passage you just have to go through that shit unless you start off on Linux then perhaps it's a brighter day a brighter future for all involved but because I'm streaming off windows I decided to stick to Windows. Maybe I will switch because I know I know a different. So this is Streamlabs OBS. Um, OBS is an open source piece of software um, that does have a Linux version, so I can use that. The Streamlabs version or fork of OBS is Windows only, but it just has a really nice interface. OBS is harder to use, but now that I know what I'm doing with streaming, I can probably use OBS instead. So I just need to test it, and so. Come back, check out Raft when it starts at the beginning of Raft. I think I think I am gonna just do that on Linux. Maybe, I don't know. I'm not if this actually works I might be too lazy to switch, but fuck it. It's working now. So let's get let's get started. I'm just gonna take a few deep breaths and then start on debugging schedule. Get back into the mindset of thinking about work after all of that stuff. So it's um, you know, um, I, I gave myself the thirty yeah thirty five minutes to let off some steam there. So sorry if you were tuning in expecting actual work, but such is life. You know, this is supposed to be a sort of stream that covers. I mean, I didn't live stream my six hour fight with my battle with Windows fucking epic saga, but um, I I just summarized what happened in it just now and. You know, the stream is supposed to cover like the entire process rather than just the, the not even just the fun parts, but the like actual work parts. But yeah. this is me, you know, charting my way through distributed systems, basically. Okay. So I'm gonna start in you know, like a minute after a bit of breathing, a bit of Zen focus. Hopefully I finish today, I'm really hopeful, because then I get to just let off steam going to Jazz Refresh, like I said tonight, going to see um, Theo Croker coming in from America, playing with uh, almost like a house band of locals from London, uh, Joe Armand Jones and Moses Boyd, shout out, some very talented musicians. Um, but yeah. I am, uh, you know, excuse the like general grogginess as well. I um, decided to just sort of wake up and stream, wake, wake and stream, uh, just to see if I can get everything done. Still struggling to get to bed on time, unfortunately, but it's okay. The streams are, you know, I started basically on time. Um, so, shame about, really a shame about the heat on this laptop. I don't know why it's now so hot in my home. Did, I, I wonder if all the thermal paste melted because of the streaming. I can repaste it. Not ideal if you have warranty, but I can just, I can get Dell to come and repaste it myself if I want to. Just claim that, you know, it's running extremely hot. Um, yeah. Okay. Boyos. So you see the Are We Live thing. I'm just going to, um, that was there so that we know that we've entered schedule. Of course, I can do go test run P. And what you will see, even though it doesn't work, is 
Are we live? We are live and well. Hello. Awesome. So we know schedule is working. It's throwing all these warnings about the um, RPC register thing. Loads of asynchronous warnings, as you can see. I don't know what 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 that what that is. Maybe I'll fix that. Maybe I won't. But it's easy to ignore. The point is the actual schedule thing. You know, it has a schedule start. Doesn't have a schedule end because it failed to end. We're going to fix that. <coughs> um, but it also has all this info about you know map task zero one two. It assigned map task zero. It finished map task zero. This is the actual worker talking about you know what it's done. See, there are only two workers, right? So you know, given map task zero, worker ten, map task done, and then worker zero pulls off the next task and. This seems to basically work as intended. Let's have a, just a very quick reminder of what the code is. Um, it's really simple code, that's why I'm happy to just go through it again. It's really short. Um, you know, we have, um, I would say, Free Chan. As much as I like the name Free Chan, um, I think I'm going to rename it to Idle Workers so that it matches idle tasks then it's going to be completely clear what the code does. So let's do a change. Rename rename symbol should crash, I think. It doesn't actually work. Because God knows someone. Oh, it did work. It seems to have done everything that I wanted it to. Idle workers, yep, idle workers. And then, you know, instead of free workers here, everything is idle workers. And of course, I am getting the warning about unreachable code. It is true that this is indeed unreachable code. I didn't believe it at the time, but we'll fix that. Um, so basically, this is this is it. Okay. So idle workers is the channel in which is a channel in which. Um, actually, one thing I am going to say here is going to format do some conventions. So ID conventions. I'm going to just write those down to make it clearer. Um, workers by address string semicolon tasks yeah I'm just going to get rid of this capsule here semicolon tasks by um, id brackets int so this is just the kind of so that it makes it easier to see why idle workers is a string channel and idle tasks is an integer channel and done tasks is also an integer channel. The workers and tasks are at all times identified by workers by the address, which is a string, and tasks by ID, which is an integer. So worker address is as it comes from register chan, which is the channel that the workers register in. And so I'm literally just continuing on the convention of using the addresses that come from there and sending them back into the idle workers channel. Uh, whereas tasks by ID, integer, um, those are just um, basically I am I think, yeah, I think um, that's also specified by, you know, do task Sorry, do map and do reduce. We implemented those. Those take IDs. Um, what do I mean? Well, what I mean is when I do the RPC call for it to actually do the task, task number gets assigned, okay? And so I'm trying to match. Task number is supposed to be a number from 0 to the number of tasks minus 1 inclusive. So, you know, there are that many tasks, as many as you'd expect. Um, but also for map, that matches the number of input files, and for reduce, it matches the number of output files. And so I said in the map case, um, task also were functions as a canonical index for map files, which is the list of input files. Um, so that's that's an explanation of what the uh, the um, workers and tasks are identified as. So I am actually not making objects or anything to represent them. Instead, workers are, for the purposes of the scheduler, they are their addresses and the tasks are their IDs, ranging from 0 
to n tasks minus 1 so that there are n tasks. n tasks being that phase, n other being the other phase. Um, not going to. Not going to go into too much detail because I, you know, went through all that last time. But yeah, there's a you know a channel of idle workers, which we have a forwarding channel. Which um, takes registered workers and sends them into idle workers. At all times, so the go forward channel is just an infinite loop of forwarding, infinite loop, forwarding. A goes into B, right? That's what this code means. This means take a thing from A, and this means send that thing on to B. And that's just always running in the background in a separate coroutine, i.e. go routine. So that's why it says go forwards, go forwards, go forth, and conquer. Um, so yeah, register channel is being forwarded to idle workers. Idle tasks and done tasks are two new channels of tasks. They're going to be integer. Idle tasks is n task has an n task buffer because I'm using it to actually store all of the tasks that are not done. So this is like the task queue. This is where I fill in idle tasks. Idle tasks arrow i for every i from zero to n tasks minus one inclusive or my, just n tasks if you're not inclusive. You know that's what the fuck's sake that that's what this means. Cool. Um, and because this is a buffer channel, doing this will fill it up precisely, and then the code will continue. If, if this were not buffered, or if the buffer was smaller than the number of things I put into it, then it would literally freeze here. It would lock there and wait until some other routine pulled something out of idle tasks. So for the purposes of our design of a task queue, we just need there to be end tasks. Right, and then the main loop um, is a select statement that pulls new any uh, any of worker that's available out of idle workers. You know, uh, pulls a task at, when it when it succeeds in pulling out an available worker, it pulls out an available task, sets the task arguments correctly. These are just details. You know, in the map phase, we have to assign the file name as well. Otherwise, we just send in that shit. Go do task. Uh, and in the case, and we also have the done tasks thing, which detects things coming in from done tasks. Increments a counter, which we also defined, which is the number of things in done tasks. So every pull from done tasks is matched by an increase in done counter. And here we just check once done counter has reached end tasks, break. Um, and break should jump us to here to this line of code. It doesn't because there's a bug. But that's what should be happening. And do task literally calls, uh, does the RPC call, and waits for a response. Because this is running in a concurrent coroutine, waiting for a response is not going to freeze any of the other do task instances or anything else. Um, if the return is a success, um, so if this returns true, which it means it succeeded, then it pulls um, a, a new worker out. It pulls the worker out of free chain. Else, it takes the task and puts it back onto idle tasks and forgets about the worker. And we said we're forgetting about the worker. Reason being, um, you can't get back into contact with the worker that's stopped responding, and that's the kind of thing that this is supposed to deal with. All right. What I'm going to do is look at the codes here. So you can see a lot of the stuff is actually working correctly. Like for example, it is when every every call is successful in this particular test. That's how it's been designed. Uh, it's only part four of the project where we will deal with failing calls. So this will always be working, and indeed it is working because workers do always get thrown back onto free chan, and they do always do the work. We have, uh, we have. I think I know where the deadlock is. Just by explaining all of this, I've realized that the deadlock is here. Basically, see how uh, whenever this succeeds, it sends the worker back onto free chan. Well, when the worker is available on free chan, it will continue pulling workers, and so it will deadlock here because there are no more idle tasks at the end. This is the end that I'm talking about. Done tasks will also fill in at that point, but there is a race condition effectively that 
if you're lucky that done tasks get uh, gets executed first, which seems to be never happening, then it will literally um, continue on here and finish the as it's supposed to. It's going to finish the schedule routine and exit and return. But if instead it first first manages to pull the idle worker, well, there are no more tasks, and so it just hangs here, deadlocks here, which is not good. So that's what we need to fix somehow. Um, what I am going to do is a quick debug, uh, which is to say I want to find out if done counter is actually working properly. So, uh, so I'm just going to debug that by doing a print statement along the lines of um, hash done comma done counter. So I'm going to print done counter and that should tell us every time this section of code is run. So let's run it. So nice being able to test this, you know, full concurrent thing. Um, not not working on the actual distributed computers, but using all the protocols, simulating pretty much everything except for the distributed file system. That's the only thing that's not being simulated as far as I understand this project. Go, test, run. It's just council workers and vans out here. Yeah, I should say, um, you know, I showed you guys the um, arch at Riverside Gardens where I live, so I can just, yeah, let's take like a one minute break. Let me just jump up the camera. You know, this is the arch where I live. Fucking council trucks pass through it because on the other side is a private council car park. So there's no actual access. Which is, you know, I, I don't have a car, so it's fine, but it is a bit of a nightmare for anyone who drives and lives in this estate because um, the, the only road that connects to it is one way, so you have to do massive cycles in order to park in this area because you can't exit here to get to the other outside the one-way loop because there are fucking council vans there. It's, um, yeah, it's the council being greedy, but at the same time, it actually suits me because um, there's a lot less noise from cars passing through here, so it's it's not it's not for me personally. It's fine. I don't argue with them about that. Cool. So go test run p. You know, don't forget this does both of the parallel tests. It matches them. Yeah, this this is definitely not. working at all. So the, the whole done tasks system is not working. This is this is our problem. So it's not even that there's a race condition because this entire section of code is not being run. I think the problem is I'm not assigning to done tasks. I, did I forget to assign to done tasks? Yes, I did. If it's successful, then the task gets assigned to done tasks, obviously. Oh. Funny how I forgot that. Very simple, very simple edit there. Jesus Christ, what do you mean done tasks? Oh, yeah. As always, all the channels have to be fucking passed in because... Um, just by the design of this, I would like... Uh, I would like to have a think of if, it, if it's possible to... Um, I'd like to have a think if it's possible to actually get all these declarations outside of the schedule function so that everything can be linked up without having to pass references around. The problem, of course, is that we can't set the buffer correctly by doing that because um, you know when the channel is defined, its buffer is defined, and it depends on end tasks, which is passed into the schedule function in the first place. So unless I wanted to wrap the schedule function in a different function, like the main section of the schedule function, which is um, syn synchronously executed within schedule. So basically having another layer of wrapping is, the, I guess, the alternative. So it's like, yeah, when, when I make a function that's like schedule, pass all the arguments in, like an interface to the actual underlying schedule function, which then uses the buffer and everything. Sorry, uh, what, what, what do I mean by that? Um, so yeah, I was trying to describe wrapping a function. So uh, 
it would be instead of running the main schedule code in the schedule function, I have the schedule function as the interface that's used by the rest of the program. Uh, and it calls a sort of a sh like the actual schedule function, but um, I can within that wrapper I can define these channels and I can execute everything else within there. So it gives me another kind of block context to work with that would allow me to possibly not not certainly I can't fully visualize it, but possibly it would allow me to get around having to pass all these references in because I could just define things outside the main function. Laptop is taking off again. Toasty, toasty, toasty. So fucking hot. I'm really getting tired of it now. Uh, anyway, yep, I've linked it up. I'm not going to, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm not going to obsess over implementation details. This definitely works, you know. I'm just passing arguments about that's fine. They are just references to existing channels. Uh, they, they look like they're not references, but I think channels are always passed by reference. Um, so... Uh, lol, 204 seconds. Um, now that I am actually sending on to done tasks, I'm going to get the deadlock that I was talking about. So this still should not work. In principle, it might work, but it should not always work. So let me, let me put my money where my mouth is. How do I copy from this terminal? By pressing enter. Yep, see, the duns are coming through. Exactly what I said would happen did happen. <laughs> so all the duns are actually coming through. Uh, but here, it's finished 19, it's pulled the next task, it's deadlocked, before the done channel could register that 19 happened. If I try running this again, it happened, the same thing happened. Um, According to the Go documentation, you can't expect the same thing to keep happening. It could be possible that 19 happens and it works, but maybe not. So yeah, pulling idle workers is the thing that's not possible to do. That's the... Okay, the trouble is I could pull idle tasks as well, but if I do that, then the code hangs while waiting for a new worker. Is that good? Do we want that to happen? Possibly yes, because if there is an outstanding task in idle tasks, it's definitely not done. It's definitely not supposed to be in done tasks. It means if it if this thing managed to pull a task from idle tasks, then that task is like for real not done, and so there's no problem with the deadlock happening that that task should have made it into done tasks. Okay, let me just, sorry, I, I do these at the most random points because I just get sort of distracted uh, this way, isn't it, yep. But so far I've never had to adjust this midstream, so it's all good. So yeah, like I was saying, um, I should finish now, stop that. If it pulls from idle tasks, that task is never done, and so um, even though there could be something in done tasks that should be being done, and so it's not as concurrent as it could be, because it could maybe be doing this while waiting for the next worker, at the same time this has such a low footprint, it literally just, it's not even going to be printing later, it's literally just going to be incrementing a counter. Uh, I think it's fine to not have this executes as and when. Well, I mean, it doesn't execute as and when now, as demonstrated by this. But the point is, pulling from idle tasks is not going to change that, and it's also not going to lead to a task deadlock for the reason I just mentioned. So this case will only run when um, idle tasks is going. But in the case that that happens, it waits until a worker is available for that task. That means it's not doing this while the worker is available. Um, but that's not a problem because that task, this is meant to task, this is meant to literally just check if everything is done. That's the only purpose of this loop and everything's definitely not done 
if there is still a task that has been called and not assigned to a worker. This should work completely. Like I'm confident that this will pass the test. The only thing is um, it would be more elegant in the code to wait for both of these things at the same time. I'm not sure if that's possible. I'm just going to quickly check. Uh, might learn something, you know. It's always, always good to learn something. So go lang select. Um, uh, two channels in one case. That's basically what I'm looking to do. Reading from multiple channels simultaneously. Yes, effectively that's what I want to do, isn't it? A sort of zip function. Yeah, you, you can you can see what this is doing. It's kind of talking about a quick um, a function that pairs. You know, this would be like a function that pairs up channels and workers, and so it waits for one of each to be available, which is effectively the same as what I do, but uh, totally unnecessary. Um, when I you know when this will work, it would just make the code more elegant. It would be nice if I could do a select. Yeah, this is literally a wrong answer. For the reason that this guy said this is not reading simultaneously, this is just the standard select case. Um, might, might just have a look here as well. But yeah, what I would love is if this worked. This will probably throw a syntax error. But basically what I would love is if I could type this. The you know conceptually what this code is doing is pulling task and workers simultaneously and only when both of them are available does it execute. I think you heard it here first. I think this will become a la an actual language feature in a few years. You know uh, here is like a non-declaration statement. What if I put a like a semicolon in? No way, unexpected semicolon. Yeah, it absolutely does not work. But it is more important to wait on idle tasks than it is on work idle workers. Sorry, what is the problem? There is no problem, it's just this is messing me about. You know, again, this is saying unreachable code. We'll find out in a sec. Um, ah, this is some like detail about select, I don't know. Never mind. Okay, yeah, I did to hope that that was possible. It is possible if you use a ma manual function, but that's completely unnecessary complexity when I can just do this. Like I said, work waiting on a worker will not work because um, if all the tasks are done, it could deadlock because um, there will always be new workers available. Whereas waiting on idle tasks won't deadlock because that will actually get emptied out. And so they will definitely move on to done tasks by the design of the program. It won't get emptied out if the workers continue to fail over and over again. So I might do a counter to track that. And because it's concurrent, it should in principle get incremented if I just do like a fail counter return if enough fails thing here. It's still saying the code is unreachable. Let's see if it works though. Moment of truth. What the hell happened there? This did not work. Well, it executed in a highly random order. Um, look at this. So it went like task zero, done, one, two. So the done channel is correctly tracking everything. But um, look at this. Task 17 got done. Task 18 and 19, they both returned. Done 18 got posted, but done 19 didn't. Why? You know, when this returns, it should pass, it should send out this message, but it should also send the thing onto done tasks. So, does it deadlock again? But why won't the laptop chill out seriously in 90 degrees? 
It's 90 degrees despite not running much CPU. You say that. Whenever I look at it, it sort of just jumps up to some silly number. Never mind. Um, so I was I was confident the code was going to work, but it didn't. Did not, alas. Um, so what's going on? There's some sort of a deadlock happening again. Let's let's just repeat this test. Clear it is not going to do anything unless I completely reinitialize the terminal. Close and open, I mean. Um, go test run P. So again, you see this time it's executed in a fairly different order. Um, this is a bit messed up, isn't it? Uh, right, done counter should go up. How many tasks are there? Sorry. No, no, there are, there are 20 tasks. There are definitely 20 tasks. Look at the input files at the top here. Zero to, God knows why some of those were new. Uh, 20, 20 tasks. And so done counter should be in principle one ahead. Usually, which it mostly is. It's just here. It deadlocks again. Why? Um, well, the easiest way to check for deadlocks is to print learn, uh, you know, A and B. So A is um, denotes that it's entered the task block, and B denotes that it's entered the done block, right? Um, so let's let's run that. Debugger, debugger, debugger. So like I have I have here, you know, A. A is entered for the last time here. But some, somehow it's managed to enter without printing A here. Ooh. Yeah, this code is, you know, hi highly, highly not working as I really wanted it to. I'm just trying to see what's going on in the output here. Struggling with a slightly dodgy touchpad. Oh yeah, I should control C, of course, um, to terminate execution. Well, the thing is, um, a lot of asynchronous stuff it's happening here, so lots of out of order execution. Um, so I'm going to need to put in more information into the uh, these statements. Um, so I'm going to say a, and then I'm going to print the task number. Okay. In the case of B, well, B and done always print synchronously, or at least they should, because it's always going to, the, well, not necessarily it is possible for a random thing to print at a stupid time, but like B and done have been printing at, at the same time in principle. It's not guaranteed, but very likely, I think. Um, so I'm going to just put a B statement here to simplify the um, appearance of the of the console output. Now I really want to know what's going on here. No. Seemed like it should work, but it didn't. A19 executes here. Oh, but A, A is supposed to execute 20 times, isn't it? You say that. You say that, not necessarily. A0, given map task 0, A1 does that as well, A2 executed again. Oh right, A0. Ah yeah, okay, so it's supposed to end on 19. So A19 did happen. 
And indeed, this also did happen. So that's all correct. Uh, the problem is uh, B, which is supposed to start at 1, indeed it does start at 1, is supposed to finish at 20, but this stops loading um, for some reason. Um, so the question is, you know, when, when map phase task 19 done happens, what, what happens then? Um, and it's difficult for me to immediately spot that. Um, I'm just going to try. Uh, let me just center the camera. Do. I should get do probably to log stuff. Um, like I said, I don't believe that this piece of code is even going to be running. It's implemented, but not running for the time being. I cannot, of course, print what's in free chan and done tasks without pulling stuff off the channel. Channels are designed like that. There's no real introspection into what the channel is doing. The only thing you can do is get the length of the channel. Um, introspect to the length, that is possible um, in Go. Uh, uh, how, to, how to debug this? Well, our problem is it deadlocks here. It's almost as if it just stops putting stuff into done tasks. Worker gets assigned to... Uh, wait, wait, wait. Free chan needs to be buffered, doesn't it? Yeah, I think free chan needs to be buffered. I think that's what the problem is. This is where it hangs, because free chan is an unbuffered channel. Okay, spotted it. Good, good, guys. Um, free chan is... Uh, my initial design was to say free chan should be an unbuffered channel. The reason being that... Um, It should be possible for it to pick up it should be possible for us to assign to well the reason being that things were immediately being pulled in the previous implementation where this this was pulling from idle workers oh shit why does it say free chan here oh yeah of course because it matches the signature let me just um, fix that. This is not going to make any difference. This is just visually. Because in a different function, it, this matched the signature, so it was uh, not a problem that it was still called free chan. That's not what the problem was. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the, the, the idle workers channel, don't forget, same channel as in the rest of the code because channels are passed by reference. Um, I, I chuck the worker back in idle workers, but if it's not buffered, then it, it ends up waiting for the worker to be pulled out here, which doesn't happen if you've run out of tasks, and so it deadlocks. How to deal with that? Um, a hack would be to just add to the buffer. But something dodgy to me about doing that. Um, not necessarily. It's not dodgy at all. Is it? Okay, question. What gets what what bits of code actually put stuff in idle workers? That's 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 an interesting question. The reason being how does for example the forwarding routine work? This thing which is being used literally you know this um, should really just be an anonymous function. Writing it this way is just confusing. I'm going to write this anonymously. So okay. Bear with, a small edit in the code is happening. When I say anonymously, I mean I'm not declaring a new function. Instead, I'm just jumping up here. Um, oh, I shouldn't have saved. I'm just jumping up here where I'm running forward and I'm running a function, an anonymous function. Is it possible for me to not run a function but a code block in a Go routine? Let me just check that.
This isn't gonna do what I want. I don't want the go command, I want the go keyword. Um, Oh. Ah, look at this. Ghost type system has no hierarchy. This is a separate to what I'm thinking about now, but that's the thing that I was trying to describe that I liked about it. Okay, never mind. This does not seem to actually be a thing. Yeah, okay, so I, I said, you know, making it anonymous would make it clearer. But if I define the function in this scope, then I can just make it a uh, function that looks like this. <laughs> if this doesn't work, I'm going to be undoing a lot of changes. Whoops. But well, that's fine, you can just control Z your way through life when you're programming, it's not, not the same as actual life. But of course, yeah, register Chan is getting forwarded to idle workers, that's the entire purpose of this. Uh, so I may as well, my, my thinking is I may as well write it like that. This will still get passed into the function as a kind of closure, um, I believe. Let's, let's have a look. Um, yeah, expression must be a function call, so I'm just going to call the function. Yo. Okay. So let's run that. Hopefully that's not changed anything. Um, go test run p. Yeah, it looks identical to me. Okay, so my point is, I'm what I what I'm interested in is um, whether or not whether or not you know the things that are getting assigned to idle workers. This will always because it's running concurrently. It will always just wait for idle workers, uh, for anything that's in the register channel to drop into idle workers. So if idle workers is not, doesn't, is not necessary, then we can leave it. On the other hand, this puts stuff on idle workers regardless of, uh, regardless of whether or not the worker is needed. So if you wanted to directly hack this and make it work with the minimum conceptual effort possible, what you could do is run a coroutine that does this, that is forever trying to chuck. But that, that's a waste, of because then you end up starting loads of coroutines that literally never finish. No, 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 they do finish. Sorry, they do finish. Oh, okay, Sh shall I just do that then? The alternative is that I buffer the channel. I leave one free slot, literally just one free slot. Because then this will pass, but then before this gets called again. No, that's no good because that will make it less concurrent than it should be. I like my idea better. The conceptual idea it makes a lot more sense to me. Okay, so here we run a concurrent routine, another anonymous function cool and this is what it does so there's an anonymous call to send worker back to idle workers that gets run asynchronously because it's in a go routine this continues on its way this starts an anonymous go routine effectively for every well, I think all go routines are anonymous, but the function it's running is also anonymous. That's why I'm calling it an anonymous go routine. Uh, all instances, I should say, all all threads, go threads, whatever. Um, so running that in the background will send it back whenever the idle worker is required, because it it means it has something to send. But when this has something to receive, then the transaction will happen. But this will block when trying waiting to receive, which is correct. Because if there's no free worker, it should block and wait for the worker. What else could it do? On the other hand, 
when it comes to sending, that doesn't block. Sending the worker into idle workers. It just doesn't block this line of code. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think it's unnecessary to analyze that much further. Let's just run it and see if it works. Well, this has completely worked now in the sense that done counter has hit end tasks. We've hit the break statement and the break statement has failed because it doesn't do what I thought it does. So I'm just going to, that's a minor fix, I think. You know, break. The break, the breaks. Okay, go test, run, p. Yep, it hits the break section and then doesn't break out of the select statement, which is just stupid. How, how does one break out of select? Go, break out of select. Hello. You know, I put in break and it doesn't work. Why? Break statement terminates execution of the innermost for switch or select statement. Yeah, but there's no for here. Select is what I'm trying to get it. Um, oh, it has to break out of for as well. Ah, oh, shit. Yeah, the problem is you need, you need a double break and it's not really possible to do that. You're breaking, you're just breaking out of select. If you break, replace break with return, then it will work. Return is appropriate. That's definitely true. I just didn't want to use it because I wanted the code to be written such that this just continues on to here. But for what I'm using it for, I think break is indeed necessary. Sadly, return, sorry. So yeah, this is indeed unreachable. The, I just didn't realize when I wrote the code, I didn't realize that break does not break out of, it breaks out of select before it breaks out of four. I thought it would just break out of both, but. Rip. You know, here we are with the return statement done. Test is going to pass. Trust me, that is. Man's never been shut down, eh? It's funny when we when we realized that that was uh, like it came from a Drake vine or something. It's not even a British guy who said that. Go test run p all the p's bang worked. What is going on? Pass done though. Okay, six point seven seconds. Ubuntu. Everything is working. Uh, yep. So that's it. Oh, it's actually del it's deleted all the temporary files as well which is fair enough. Um, I guess if it passes, then it passes. I'm just gonna move my ass because I was getting a bit tight again. Um, let me just set the camera up again. I quite like this position. Let me just, whoa. If I, if I move the box down, it just dips like this because it's the contour of the bed comes down because of my fat ass. Yeah, so. Uh, all good. Yeah, that's it, man. That's it. It works. It's done. It took a bit longer than I thought it would to debug that. Um, made a few errors. Well, one of them was forgetting this core piece of functionality that was part of the design in the first place. And then another was blocking on weight on... Um, Another problem I had was blocking here, waiting for the worker to be free instead of the task. Because the work, workers are always, there's always going to be another worker. That's a, a different part of the program manager's thing. Whereas once we run out of tasks, that's when we want to make sure we're not in that section anymore. And so now it waits for idle tasks instead of workers. That's done. Uh, let me just delete all the print statements as well. Other, other than that, it's completely clear what happens. 
Oh yeah, sorry, and also I had to I had to run this in a co-routine as well, just to make sure it didn't block. This is a nice simple way of making sure something doesn't block, uh, because once this transaction is done, it just returns and disappears. So, you know, no no leak, no channel leak. So it's all good. And uh, you know, I managed to put I put in a because this this function is so simple that it really made made sense to just um, write it down as an anonymous function. Maybe I should comment the code slightly more. So here I'll say something like uh, forwards register churn to idle workers. Right? These are all pretty self-explanatory in my opinion. The select is uh, pulling from simultaneously idle tasks and done tasks. And the done task counter is the thing that's going to return eventually when we hit the hit everything is done. The the arguments and that are fine and then the go routine just has to uh, must not block. Um, idle workers only consumed if idle task consumed so this must not block you know that's that's why this this is running a separate in a go routine as well because there are there are always going to be new idle workers and this bit of code like i said not even necessary for the test so for this this particular task so i've removed all the print statements and shit and you can see the code is, I mean, the code is pretty damn elegant, honestly. There's so little of it. And it's completely clear, completely clear what it does. I just had to fix a few, a few dodge bits and pieces. Go test run P. Let's just do it again. It does a lot of testing. Well... You know, if if we just scan through this, the testing that it does is it does the first thing that we were. Oh, whoops! This is the previous one. Sorry. I want the one that doesn't comment A and B. The one that starts here. So um, this as you can see is just the. Uh, like the first test, I can't remember what the tests are called, but the more basic of the two tests. So the schedule finish map phase done and when schedule oh yeah this is something that's organized by the master I should say um, when schedule returns from map phase then it just immediately runs to schedule and reduce phase and you know we implemented do map and do reduce right so all this works 20 input and outputs 10 input outputs as in 20 maps and 10 reduces are what's happening here. 10 reduces 20 maps. Um, you know, it literally just does them, returns, and then this is just a bit of a function at the end that gives the results. But this is, this, like we said, merging after reduce, even in the map reduce para, uh, paradigm in general, is not necessary. And then it's task completed, and then it runs the second test. Um, what does the second test look like? It looks pretty similar to me. Um, don't know what the second test is even testing for to be honest sure. I can have a quick look at it. I can have a very quick look at um, this oh, we, we can do a quick post-mortem as well just before moving on to part 4 uh, just going over to see what I've done in terms of all the hints that they gave so I think there's no need to read over all this again because we literally just, we did it all and I made sure absolutely all of it went into the design. Test parallel basic and test parallel check. Okay, so the latter verifies that it is actually in parallel somehow. RPC, we looked at that. Well, we looked at call more than we did RPC. It was documented within the... Um, the master RPC, I think, wherever call is located, I can't remember. But the point is, we know how that works. 
on that level. We don't need to go any deeper. At least I don't feel like I need to. Um, schedule should send RPCs in parallel so that the workers can work on tasks concurrently. Yep, I used Go. Schedule must wait for a worker to finish before it gives it another task, hence use channels. Sync wait group, I did not use that in the end, was unnecessary. Uh, yep, print statements, you can yeah collect the output by putting a, passing it to out using bash. This saves it to an out file. I think, what does that, well, actually what does arrow out do? Mm, not sure, maybe it loads it in notepad or something. Shall I just test that out? Like I'm gonna just go echo yo, pass it to out, see what happens. Ah, uh, it saves it to a file called out, of course. So. Cool. Yeah, so you can just do that in order to get get the output saved. Good to remember. And to check if your code has race conditions, you want to use the race condition detect to see what happens. Why not? Just see what happens. Try me. DPMO. So it's running the code silently. Once it once it's done, all this shit will be deleted, so we'll know it's done. Yep. Oh, okay, it's doing stage two of the test. Ooh, disappear, 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 disappear. Gone. Okay. That means it's done. Let's take a look at out. I mean, this looks just like the standard outputs. Oh, this is test two. I don't see anything at all about a race condition or anything. 25 seconds it took. Well, that's because it was running some sort of introspective shit, so it took longer than the standard uh, standard execution, which is only 6.6 .6 seconds. I have to say 6.6 .6 seconds, I think that's pretty fast, um, considering we're running on virtualized Ubuntu instead of Windows Bash. Like, it's pretty good. It seems to have gotten a lot faster than it was before. Computer is, oh my god, 90 degrees. The fan is properly loud now. What the hell is going on? Nothing, like... She, Dell should just be embarrassed, honestly. Yeah. To have a computer that runs at like 30% CPU and 70% GPU, and it's just running at a stable temperature of 90 degrees. Like, seriously, thermal management is... Them factory paste jobs, you know, you know the ones. All right, I'm gonna be super fucking cheeky, and I'm without even looking at part four. I'm just gonna run the test for part four. I know what the test for part four is because it's in here. Test one failure and test many failures. I mean, why is it not just? I can't test both of those. Uh, do you know what? This is just stupid. I'm going to rename them. So that failure, it's like test failure one. It's bat on the screen. Test failure one and test failure many instead of test so that I can run F. Press F to run tests, not pay respects. I don't want to use the tissue on uh, on a screen too much. Dabbing is not too bad, but you definitely don't want to rub it because it's roughly textured so hey take a look at the main shell scripts um, I just want to make sure I don't break something by renaming oh failure actually works oh okay so it doesn't just match reading left to right it actually matches by regex throughout And you'll also, no you'll also notice that the word test is completely redundant here. It, it just it literally just matches the word. It, it checks everything that begins with test with a capital test, and then it matches these words within the file name. But you can also match test parallel, because that is still the file name. Good to know. Okay, so I can literally just do this then. Ooh. 
press F. The fact that the F is capital is what identifies, you know, sequential, sequential one, sequential many, parallel, basic, parallel, check. It's the first letter of each word that gets picked up by the um, capital letter that I'm using because of the naming convention. The capitalization convention works that way. So this will definitely pick up just the failure tests. Yeah, it seems, it seems to basically be working. Wait, shit, did it pass? Did I run the right tests? Yes, and it passed. Um, what am I? What am I gonna do? What does it say at the end? Running all tests. This is what I want to do, mate. Bash, bash. Uh, yeah, got to got to set it set it to the right directory. But yeah, bash all the tests out. So in the main folder, I run this. Go. Mate, this is part one. Ah, oh, this is this is hype watching this, isn't it? Part two. Part three takes like ages to test, doesn't it? Seven seconds. Part three. A pass first time. You done know. You done know. Look at that. Oh my god! I just I I did part four without even without even do, changing a single line of code, and I fucking bossed it. Done. Fuck. Map reduce is finished. Um. Okay. So part five is the optional part. Well, for starters, yeah, the file does not exist because um, I renamed it so that. It will, I wouldn't keep getting complaints from uh, from uh, this for name collisions. But yeah, so part five fails, but oh my god, look at that, look at that. Ah, you don't know, you don't know. How did I ha yeah, well, okay, so I mean, I know, I know, I half expected this to happen. I have to, well, the reason being, I implemented the entire code in the first place with failure on my mind, right? So I, I thought to myself, you know, this, this, this block of code here, which just reassigns the task, and the thing that is constantly forwarding from the register channel, those two things between themselves, so this is the forwarding from the register channel, constant, you know, per infinite loop, and um, every task that fails just gets chucked back onto idle tasks. Those two things just are enough for it to work. That's all you need. And it is done. I did it. I fucking did it. Okay, let's just for, 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 um, I should probably read this, like, uh, just to see, you know, just to confirm from the other side that I have actually done it, like, I'm kind of surprised that I managed to pass first time something I wasn't even trying to pass. But like like I said, it's just um, another thing I will say, by the way, um, I wasn't trying to get it to pass part four when designing it for part three. Instead, I was just using the general my general understanding of how it was supposed to work. And um, implementing it that way naturally, so you know the knowing that it could fail it might not fail knowing that this returns true if it does not fail um, means that I can do an if statement and then I loosely conceptually know what's supposed to happen if it does fail and so I can I implemented this line of code at the time as a result um, so just having the broad concepts in mind meant that I managed to program for part four without explicitly doing it because if you explicitly do it you can make it more difficult for yourself if you're trying to do too many things at once like trying to do part three and part four at the same time means that things are less broken down and you're more susceptible of just
code that doesn't work and then you don't know what you're doing, right? But basically I managed to first time, with the exception of those three bugs that I fixed, um, in order to get part three working, I managed to first time pass part four using that code and I'm just fucking chuffed because it means I've succeeded. I can actually give, like, drop all this shit and hit Jazz Refreshed and celebrate. Check it out. Actually, I mean, um, one thing I will say, so I said in the stream here at the top, uh, you know, up here, it says the uh, next sesh question mark. So the point was, if I finished MapReduce, I was going to say, I was going to take a break for about the same amount of time that it's taken me to do MapReduce, which is realistically four days. Uh, it was actually five days because of the massive like Linux shit that happened yesterday. But um, other than that, it was you know about four days, and I think that's about the length of the break that I'm going to take. So uh, say like first, second, third, fourth, I am out, and then maybe on the fifth I start Saturday again, right? So every two weeks I start a new project. Uh, I think that's cool because then I can do raft in this time, and then when the World Cup starts, I'm on hiatus, perhaps until July, and then I'll do the rest of the projects. You best believe I'm streaming Raft as well, because I've enjoyed it so much, the streaming. Um, it is pretty good for getting, you know, I, I am aware that I'm not always being completely clear with the way that I'm speaking, but I'm practicing that. Practicing taking the step back. And I might I might get a few friends to just watch particular bits of the stream and just say, like, oh, is, is, this, uh, is this clear what I'm saying? Does it make sense in isolation? You know, it's not, it does require a bit of context to know what I'm talking about, but it um, should, should be okay if the, the actual explanations are coming along. Boss, MapReduce is finished, uh, except for the optional project, which, cool, I may or may not do that later. It's probably not going to take too long to do an optional project. This is another worked example. Windows 10. Take a look, okay, let's take a look. What, what? What the hell is this? Get Windows to speak your language. Local experience, meaning it's actually speaking, what, British English? United Kingdom? Two stars. Um, I mean, this is quite literally just standard localization. I don't understand why it's being built as a new, as a new um, feature. There's a U in color. Was there not a U in color before? <laughs> this is this is my guy. The guy who said this is just my guy. <laughs> like seriously, why is Windows? Windows is bigging itself up for doing like completely obvious stuff that it should have done before anyway, and uh, ruining settings as well. Can't install standard. Why does the thing exist, boss? Fuck knows. All right. Next uh, 14 minutes of this stream are going to be the last the last stream until Raft, until I start on Project 2. So Project 1, like I said, done. The optional bit I will do after, whenever I want to, honestly. Um, not now, because I do need to. I, I do want to stop. You know, it was really bothering me that MapReduce was still going on just because of the Linux shit. Like, I didn't spend that much time debugging it, realistically. Just everything got drawn out because of the fight, the battle. Battle, 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 someone. Um, are there any last changes that I want to make? Probably not. Instead, I was going to use the next 13 minutes to just summarize or whatever but not even i'm not i'm probably not going to have that much to say and i don't i don't want to just keep rambling so I will, I will try to keep it concise um this code is yeah i think i'm happy to leave it i, I know i haven't really commented all of my code that well particularly on the do map do reduce map reduce stuff but um i don't think it's really necessary just beyond understanding what 
MapReduce does in, in the global sense, I think it's okay not to... Maybe I'll go back and comment it at some point. Um, but for the time being, I think it's... I think I'm happy to just leave it. Say, you know, the coursework is done. Um, we'll, we'll do we'll do Raft. I'll, I'll try, perhaps as an experiment, just try to put in more comments as I'm doing it. Um, as far as understanding is going, so I, I did that massive summary of uh, of how MapReduce works after part two, because I wanted to um, try to get my head around how the actual core is supposed to work. So the scheduler, I would say, is easier to understand. Once you have the, the general idea in mind, the scheduler makes perfect sense. And... The implementation in Go, you can basically, because you have the channels. It's such a nice abstraction of concurrency using channels and then putting them in coroutines. It means that you can basically, you know, uh, always always just write down what you're, well, if you can think the right way, the code that you've written down makes perfect sense conceptually. So all the forwarding onto channels that's happening here, you know where things are going. It kind of works like a company. Right, so the idle workers just manages all of the workers that are left. The worker can get chucked onto idle workers. Tasks are moved onto either done tasks or idle tasks, depending on whether it passed or failed, got done or didn't get done. You know, this is concurrent for the reason that idle workers needs to uh, never hang, um, unless it needs to hang. So uh, pushing onto this will cause it to freeze. If, unless you do it concurrently and then this routine exits once it's done so there's no leak um, this is just some boilerplate literally this section is just pure boilerplate unnecessary it pulls a task, it pulls a worker, it blocks on the task but only blocks on the worker once the task is done Do executes that concurrently and otherwise it's always waiting for to count the done tasks and return when it's done right and that's literally it, that's it so simple how this works. The failures handled by this code perfectly well as well. Oh yeah, I did say I would read through this, didn't I? Shall we shall we read through it? Let's read through it. Because I've just done I've just looked at this conceptually and explained it and it just I feel like I no, I I, I understand how the um, how MapReduce works. Even as a distributed system, I feel like I understand how it works. I'm using RPC, not understanding RPC that much, but that's fine. I'm just building up. Um, building up by first understanding MapReduce, and then I may move on to other things. You know, well, we'll do Raft next, but RPC and that kind of stuff I could also look into if I wanted to do an internet protocol. But it's separate. You know, things build on each other, and it doesn't. You don't have to build everything from the bottom up. Uh, you can just use things, and that's fine. So let's have a look at this. You will make the master handle failed workers. MapReduce makes this relatively easy because, okay, this is worth reading. Workers don't have a persistent state. Yeah, so you don't have to, uh, if a worker fails while handling an RPC from the master, the master's call will eventually return false due to a timeout. In that situation, the, the master should reassign the task given to the failed worker to another worker. So we don't have to clean up after the worker. This is why this sentence is important in later projects the handling of failures is going to be harder because you cannot just what I mentioned about completely forgetting the worker exists you cannot do that of course you know workers existing in that the rest of the code will manage that but the bit that I was working in on particularly the scheduler does not care um, cool that's fine uh, if there is a persistent state obviously there will be information in the worker that the scheduler needs to get back and so there will have to be more um, a, a more detailed exit routine. Because here there is nothing. So if you look at this, we have the worker. In the case of failure, right, worker and task. Um, we have task and worker plus a bunch of details here. But it's do is really essentially a function of task and worker. Possibly also the arguments to specify what's going on. Um, if if the call fails, notice how worker does not even come into it. 
That's what I mean. So some code that does something to the worker here. In the case of you know persistent, that that can be used for persistent state things. You know the worker's work outlives the worker, whereas in this case the worker's last job, if it crashes, it's completely forgotten about. So let's keep going. An RPC failure doesn't necessarily mean that the that the worker didn't execute the task. Uh, the worker may have executed it, but the reply was lost. Uh, or the worker may still be executing, but the master's RPC timed out. Yep, doesn't matter. It may happen that two workers received the same task, computer generate output, fine. Uh, two invocations of a map or reduce function are required to generate the same output for a given input. Um, i.e. the map and reduce functions are functional, as in deterministically specified by how many invocations are needed. That's obvious from a pure function in maths, you wouldn't even think about that. It's like, well, obviously every function that is built up of multiple functions is always exactly that many steps. Um, so there won't be inconsistencies if subsequent processing sometimes reads one output and sometimes the other. Um, true. Again, this is the determinism of map and reduce being functional. I guess, okay. In situations where your map and reduce pure functions, well, I keep calling them pure functions. If you don't use a pure function for the map and reduce user-defined functions, then this is saying, okay, maybe you will get different results. Um, the thing is, when it says, you know, it may be reading from different workers, if a worker crashes, I, I guess it may do because reduce. Um, oh, this is an interesting point. Why might the implementation that I'm using not really work in practice, even though it passed the tests? Um, because, you know, what happens if map is working and everything, but then one of the map workers failed when the reduce worker needs to read from it. I guess then map has to be read again. So then, even though that task worked, one of the reduced workers may later try to read from the failed map worker. That may even succeed if the map worker gets turned back on or something, but that's fine because of the determinism. I think that's what this is getting at because you know, sub, it just says sub, it's using very nebulous terminology of subsequent processing. Sometimes reads one output and sometimes the other. Okay. Not worth worrying about too much because we it's speculative. We don't have a concrete thing to think about there. It's just kind of speculatively why this is in general okay. In addition, the map reduce framework ensures that the map fly. Um ensures that map and reduce functions output outputs appears atomically. The output of file will either not exist or will contain the entire output of a single execution of the map or reduce function. The lab code doesn't actually implement this, no, because it's using a fucking JSON encoder, which definitely does not do that. <laughs> if it crashes in the middle of that, it will not work. Um, but instead only fails workers at the end of a task. So there aren't concurrent executions of a task. Yeah, I don't know why uh, why they didn't just get, you know, you, you do the whole atomic rights thing. So the idea that you always save all of the outputs to a file at the same time, perhaps even synchronously, rather than keep saving to it bit by bit so you have the risk of partial information. In the fucking fly. Um, which is not was not implemented here because you know we actually went through and implemented the saving procedure flies gone and it was encoding every time a new piece of data happened it was added to the file so if that crashes midway obviously it's not it's going to give you partial output and that's not atomic it's not what it means by an atomic write here um you know not implemented here but instead it only fails at the end of a task, so it's not really a proper test then, is it? Well, I don't know why they didn't bother. You know, the, uh, it would be nice if the guy was more, uh, were more honest about why 
the lab is as it is, but never mind. That's probably asking too much. Um, you don't have to handle failures of the master. Making the master fault tolerant is more difficult because it keeps state. That would have to be recovered in, yeah, well, obviously master needs to know what's finished when, so it has a state. Um, making the master fault tolerant is more difficult because it keeps state. That would have to be recovered in order to resume operations after a master failure. Much of the later labs are devoted to this challenge. Much of the later labs are devoted to this challenge, so, you know, just saying that's what we're going to be banging out later. It's nice to keep it simple for the first lab. Map reduce. it did even say, it did even say, sorry, um, that it was kind of intended to teach you Go at, at the same time, and we had that lovely, like, implementation with the channels of the scheduler, which is very much a prime demonstration of how Go channels and concurrency is supposed to work. Be a lot very different, very different conceptually implementing that in something like JavaScript. Um, your implementation must pass the two remaining test cases in test test or go. The first test the failure of one worker, the second test um, test case test handling of many failures. Periodically, the test cases start new workers that the master can use to make forward progress, but these workers fail after handling a few tasks. Uh, I guess what that means is because it keeps killing workers, um, the task would totally fail if your scheduler were not designed to use all of the available new workers, because all the workers failed at one point, I think. I think so, but I'm not going to be anal about ensuring that that's the case if they didn't test it. I think they did test it. It's fine. Go test run failure. Failure. Full credit for this part if your software passes the test with worker failures, those run by the command above, when we run your software on our machines. It should only involve modifications to schedule.go or indeed no modifications at all. If you, if you modify other files as part of debugging, please restore their original contents and then test before submitting. Last thing I'm just going to quickly check. One of them is just going to be the, um, the thing. I wanted to... I was just curious what, in part three, the, the difference was between the tests. Well, one of them is about actual parallel and the other is like, I don't know, some, a basic test of if the RPC system is working. I guess that's it, okay. Um, and shall we just have a brief skim of the optional project, just so we know what it's about? Um, it's about the inverted index, which is about yeah searching. You know, it's a map from interesting facts about the underlying data to the original location of that data, e.g., keywords to documents that contain those words. You know, there's a second binary in uh, two go that's very similar to WC go. Modify map f in two go so that they together produce an inverted index, which should output a list of tuples one per line in the following formats. Um, right, so yeah, what this is doing is just um, mapping every word to where it appears. It's not clear from the listing above the format is word, documents, number of documents, oh, okay. Those are the documents sorted and separated by commas. <laughs> this is a funny way of putting it, but it has to be sorted by... Uh, alphabetically being Ernest, then Dorian Gray, then Frankenstein, then Grimm. Every, everything contains actual, apparently. You can see if your solution works using bash test2, and then you can test all. Before submitting, please run all the tests one final time. I have a few minutes. I I'm tempted to just do part five as well. Um, maybe spend ten fifteen minutes just discussing it, and I might even be able to just implement it, possibly. Now that I'm confident in what I'm doing, um, having you know done the summary of MapReduce, MapReduce is done. We are ready to move on to Raft. Uh, which will happen, like I said, in four or five days' time when I resume this, um, the whole thing, the whole shebang of streaming shit. 
just approaching two hours. But you know, part of part of me just wants to, while I'm still in the map reduce mindset, just say like, oh, let's have a think about inverted index generation. Um, so yeah, I guess a brief think would say like, how does this actually fit in the map reduce framework? And beyond that, how to implement the map and the reduce. Um, so again, the inputs are just going to be the words, map, spits, pairs, but instead of spitting just the number one for every count, it's going to spit the name of the, um, of the document that it came from. Reduce is then going to just assemble that name into a list of names, uh, which again fits the framework. It's going to I say I say assemble the name into a list of names. You know the key is going to be the word again, and the value, as in the outputs coming out of map, is going to be the document it comes from. And so, in order to prepare this to be reduced, the key will already be mapped to a list of of documents because the key values are aggregated by key. Don't forget. So reduce is just the identity function does nothing, passes the output. Do you know what? Let's just fucking do this. It sounds absolutely piss, so I'm just going to do it. Um, see if I can get it out in a few minutes. So listen to this main, right? We're going to take word count. Um, oh, so shit, this is the script, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to take WC go. Yeah, collapse it. Yeah, okay. WC go. Um, God, yeah, the lag again is just causing problems. Uh, I'm going to wholesale copy the map and the reduce into II, which I am going to uh, rename in a sec. Um, mapping function called once for each piece of the input in this free framework. The key is the name of the file that is being processed and the value is the file's contents. That's the input. Return should be a slice of key value pairs. Your code here, part 5. Uh, and yeah, whoops, scroll, sorry. Reduce function is called once for each key generated by map with a list of that key string value merged across all inputs. The return value should be a single output value for that key. Uh, should we just do a string concatenation instead of an identity function? Yeah, okay. Just to get the format right. Because um, there's supposed to be a single a single output value for that key. So it's going to be the thing that appears next to the key, obviously. So instead of a sum, we do a string concatenation. Um, so I'm going to copy that in from WC Go as well, just blitzing through this, waiting for it to unfreeze. Battery low, oh dear. If the, ch the chat dies on me in like the last second, it's on my on, on Dreg's Android over there. Um, Okay, this also gets copied into, whoops, scroll up, scroll up, please just scroll, what is so difficult about scrolling? I am going to try to fix the outstanding technical difficulties by the time Raft starts. Um, okay, well, I want the syntax highlighting back, obviously, so let's, uh, yep, rename it. We're going to get errors from, from name collisions, but I don't care. Um, for the time being, and let's just yeah, let's just sort it out. So map uh, again, we do the word count exactly the same, but instead of one, we are outputting the name of the file and or the title of the book, which is what format is it supposed to be in? It's it's supposed to be in the format of the actual name of the file, which is makes it even easier because I literally just put file name here. See, I changed literally one thing, and that's done. Map is map is done and reduced, and I'm just going to do a concatenate a string concatenation. So there's now no need to change anything into numbers, and so I can delete this. Instead, instead, result is going to start as an empty string, and then we are just going to concatenate. Uh, there's no there's no need to even do that. There's probably a join routine, like in JavaScript, I would just use dot join, and I don't even have to put a comma in, because comma is default for concatenation. My phone keeps receiving messages, my mum's phone, lol. I'll have to return that in a sec. Um, 
Yep, so golang join strings. Yeah, check it out. Join string sep string. Sep string is hopefully optional. This is in package string, is it? Well, you say you say sep is optional. It looks like it's not. I'll try not. I'll, I'll try not putting the argument in, but I might have to. Okay, import strings. Scroll up. Strings is already imported. Scroll down. Um, so let me just. Is this in? It's not. It's not going to be necessarily in alphabetical order. This is a slight problem. It needs to be sorted. So values needs to be sorted. Uh, let's run a sort routine on values. Um, values. How does one sort again? We're, we're sorting literally by a alphabetically, so uh, it should be completely. Uh, I can literally just copy the sort routine um, from WC. WC will already have a sort routine. I have to implement. Sorry, I have to import the. Is it WC that has a sort routine? No, it's uh, the actual MapReduce library has a sort routine. We sorted all the keys, but we now need to sort the values. So we can't just rely on the sort routine that was implemented in um, common RPC, presumably. God, it, it will be good to get this laptop to just chill out. Um, it's not common RPC, it's something else. It's master RPC? No, it's common reduce, sorry. Got, got confused. So yeah, sort is here. I'm going to be sorting according to a lambda. If I can just find where the sort is, sort slice, that's the one I want. Um, this also does an alphabetical sort already, so I literally just wholesale apply that to value instead of key, and it will be done. Make sure I'm editing to go this thing. Uh, and I'm editing the reduce function. So I'm sorting value, values, using uh, the ij sort that is sorting literally just the string itself, input array i greater than input array j. Um, so that is all sorted. And then what we do is we return values dot join which uh, is not how it works in go you're supposed to use strings dot join apply to values so obviously join has to be capitalized because of the whole export convention only capitalized methods are exported join and um, what we're joining is values right now delete all the redundant code down here Scroll up. Uh, so I want to see if I can just quickly simplify the code. So if I do this. Um, sort slice values and then return strings join values. Hopefully that will not cause an error. Right. Uh, test. Dot. Sorry. Uh, the way we do the test is by running bash on the um, script, which is called uh, test hyphen ii ii cap. Let's do the test. Does it work? Appears to have not worked. Oh dear, Atoy is still being used somewhere. Did I not delete Atoy? Well, no, it's not that you didn't delete Atoy. I think it's just name colliding with um, WC. No, I don't think so. I think I screwed something up here. But unfortunately, it's throwing a panic without regard to where the panic was caused. But like, I'm not using Atoy anywhere in this file. 
So I think it is a name collision. WC.go is getting commented out. This is getting cleared and we are running bash dot slash I I S H sorry dot S H and it's test I I. Okay, we have some output and shit. Um, just have to make sure we don't scroll back too far. It's still t talking to me about Atoy, unfortunately. Challenge, because it's optional. But my output uh, defers... Not completely clear what, how it defers, but I think it defers because, oh yeah, what, what is my output? It's in diff out. Yeah, this is what it's supposed to be, and this is what it actually is because there's some sort of uh, a type error somewhere. I just need to ooh, track that down. Why is it telling me about Atoy? You know, I've commented out wc.go, so it's not exposing those functions that have Atoy in them. MapF, let's have a quick read through. I sort of skipped through it mostly. Um, it's a key value store for words. I just continually append key values that look like the word and the file name. That gets returned values. What's the problem? Ah, not enough. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. It's me trying to be fast and loose with. Um, yeah, dropping out the sorting method is what, what screwed this up. So the way I initially implemented it is fine. I just tried to take a shortcut and I hoped it would work. So I've got some syntax errors now coming from an extra comma. Input arrays actually values. Save. Not enough arguments here. Well, of course, this also requires a fucking comma. Oh, shit. Laptop slipped off. Let me just put it back on. It's crazy levels of heat coming from the laptop. Quick check of the temperatures now 80, 90 degrees. Um, yeah, legitimately, that's it. Boys, I am jumping back in. It's really bothering me that there's so much. I, can't, I cannot actually clear the terminal. What I'm going to do is, um, no, it's, be it's best to just do this. That's, that's the best thing in these situations. Um, bash test. No, sorry, bash uh, dot slash. What's the name of the test routine again? Test ii dot sh. This might not work because, um, so again, I'm looking at the diff. Seems more or less identical. Whoa, that's highly not identical. What's going on here? Is it not being passed to all the input files? It's doing something. Oh yeah, shit. Sorry, I haven't. You know, my output format is not correct. I haven't put the numbers in into the reduce. But also, the, the... oh, it, what is it? Is it sorted alphabetically after you put the number in?
document source is then separated by commas and the, the order it spits it out in probably gets alphabetized by the script. Okay, that's slightly concerning. It's like... Well, okay, I, I do know there is at least one thing wrong that I can just quickly fix. Um, this should be len strings, sorry, values, plus space plus the join. But len values is a number, so that needs to be atoid or just converted into a string. Oh, I see. It's atoy and itoa. So, which, which 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 one is what? Which? So the two is obviously two. But here you see a value v, which is a string, gets converted to an integer. So a, I guess, stands for string. What we want is integer to string. So I think this is the correct one. Um, let's just keep running the test command until it works. Check the diff. Diff is or is it is saved in LF already, so I think it'll be fine. Oh yeah, MR challenge and MR test out. Yeah, MR challenge. If it's going to be diffed correctly, that needs to be set to LF as well. Be careful, very careful. But like, look at this. Um, this is the diff. So what's happened here? The diff got messed up. Let's delete it and try again. See how we go. Um, Yeah, something's highly wrecked here. You know, I joined values. I did a string conversion of the length of values. Let's just call the length. this how does one concatenate strings in go quickly check that Okay, plus operator does what I think it does. What's happened with the laptop? It's fans really jumped up now. I don't know what these leaves are. Something I've not seen before in Windows. What can I say? Um, let me just. <laughs> Just adding to the urgency of getting this done. I don't. I don't know what's going wrong. Honestly, I expected this to just jump directly out. Um. 
I'm starting to get hot now from the laptop. Oh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get agitated just because I'm encountering some bugs. Considering this is basically finished, I am just gonna finish it. I'm so close. I uh, just need to. Just need to fix it and investigate what on earth is going on because it is looking quite messy, isn't it? Um, okay. Close everything. What did I modify in test MR? Sorry, I just need to check that. I don't think I intended anything to... Oh, test parallel. Yeah, happy to leave that. Modified. Um, schedule is obviously the stuff that we did today. Probably should have committed earlier, but never mind. Commented this out. Let's have a look at the intermediate files. So the map file is spitting out the correct stuff. The importance being is for you, may away, whatever. It shouldn't be filtering, it should yeah, just be uh, chucking, you know, spitting out. PG being earnest.txt with each one, yeah. Um, you know, these are getting saved to various different places. Um, then this is Dorian Gray, yep, the intermediate files all look completely legit to me. Um, just the reduce that should be joining them and prepending stuff doesn't seem to be working. Let me um, track what the reduce is outputting. Okay, so we don't clearly know that yet. Map, I'm pretty sure works, fine. Um, let's, let's just... Uh, track this by fmt.print learning you know the usual hash error hash reduce with this which is what's getting printed okay check it out do you think this is running a sequential master let's have a look at so I might be able to just test it in bash. Yeah, it is just testing it using sequential. So yeah, I can run this on bash. Let's run it on bash. Bash is a bit cleaner at the moment. Um, again, chuck the diff, delete that, and just run, yeah. Um, Put it in the main folder and then just run the routine, run the rhythm. Go. Yeah, it is printing a lot of stuff. Sorry about that. I don't know what these intermediate five things are. But as you can see, reduce what reduces spitting out looks completely legitimate to me. Does it? Does it really? Look at this. Reduce four PG Tom Sawyer. Huckleberry Finn. Every time the word appears, oh, that would be why you have these blocks. You're not. You need the words to be unique. You need uniqueness of words. So. Yeah, very different to well, slight slight detail. Slight detail. It is but a scratch. Uh, yeah, I'm. I I just concatenated all of them without regard to what the um, the frequencies. So they they all need to be unique. So I only need to add one of each file name in. So I'm definitely not just. Uh, well, how how to do that is pretty simple. It's just it's just more manual as well. So I'm gonna filter values for uniqueness uh, by literally reconstructing it. So before I even sorting, um, 
I'm going to reconstruct it by doing the following. So values, of course, is going to, by design of MapReduce, it is going to start with many different copies of a file name. Every time a word comes up, it will have it. You'll end up with this shit, 104 copies of a word. I don't know which word this is. Some stupid word. Um, but, yep, uniqueness is simply a case of using a a dictionary, you know, um, a word cache. So let's just define ourselves a word cache, a dynamic dictionary. I think this is the first time I've actually made the dictionary. I can't remember what the notation is. Um, it's going to be, keys are going to be strings, values are going to be integers, values are counters. So they can just be bool boolean as well. I think boolean is legit. Just is it there? True, false, that kind of thing. So dictionary is map whose keys are the word, the file names, and whose values are bool. I think that's the correct notation for making a word cache. Right. For each value that lies within um, values. Oh yeah, and we need to make a new array of... The reduce function does not know how many files are possibly being inputted into it, so I, I can't take advantage of that to allocate the correct amount of array space. Not a problem, not a problem. I'm just going to do it dynamically as usual. Uh, Values unique is uh, an array, a slice, a dynamic array, a, a list of strings um, of starting length zero. For values, v and range values, this is our for loop declaration. This is the content of the for loop, which is saying um, it's going to be an if. Whether or not, yeah, it's going to just return values unique to the dictionary is going to return the default value. It's Boolean, so it's going to return false if something is not there, and I'm going to assign it to true if it becomes there, if it's found. Checks out. So I can just query values unique for v, which is the words. Fetch your words. If the uh, list of Oh, it's not a, oh, sorry, it's a file name, isn't it? Sorry, the values are file name type, well, conceptual type. If it does, we, we want it to not contain. If it doesn't contain, we actually assign it. As well as, of course, appending Two values unique. Uh, we append the file name itself. I have noticed, by the way, that I'm using values unique for word cache because silly. That will just throw some sort of syntax error. No problems. Well, this is not a problem. Um, so we have values unique, and that's the thing that we're actually working with. We can like in place sort that, dear lord, that scroll there. Okay, and length has been taken or values unique. So we just, we, we just reconstructed what we want, which is a unique version of the same thing. Um, yep, we're in bash, ready to go. Uh, bash. Go, run the rhythm. Hopefully, it's not going to be nearly as awful as it was last time. Like, to... so yeah, diff out now looks nice, as you can see. 
Well, you know, it looks quite similar to what it's, the answer's supposed to be. It's just been sorted backwards. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> Lol, joke. Fucking what, mate? Man, the bloody what, man? That's fucking what you to. <laughs> Test, I, I. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to programming. Um, sorted backwards. I think this should just pass. Done. Okay. Guys, map producer's finished. I even did the optional project. I took a solid fucking half an hour, but never mind. Easy project. Just made a few mistakes, as you as you noticed. Um, you know, has this phone died? Ah, rip! I can't. The last half an hour, I've been unable to see the chats, but mercifully empty. Um, so okay, there are going. There will be name collisions, unfortunately, when I. On, oh, I need to delete all these temporary files first. Sorry. I'm gonna use yeah. I, I'm gonna delete the files using the routine that's written here, because I'm kind of scared that if I don't, it will mess something up. RM is what I need, the remove MR temp. Can just run that in bash, basho. See, I told you bash would still be kind of useful for some certain reasons. Delete diff, because there is no diff. Well, diff is going to keep reappearing, but never mind. And this has been renamed, saved. If it detects the problems of the name collision, whoops. Because it still says fucking... Well, it says package main, actually, so there, this shouldn't actually be name collisions at all, because they're, they're all just... Um, they're not exposing MapReduce methods, they're just their own thing, so I don't see why there was ever a name collision. Um, what the hell does you mean here? Untracked, yeah. Because it's, uh, I brought it back from the dead. Okay. So guys, this is this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna have to do this in Ubuntu. I'm gonna do a full test, full metal test, where I run the old bash dot slash test mr dot sh. Just watch it, you know, watch it get tested again. We know in principle that everything works. We watch the temporary files come and go here. Oops, scroll the wrong direction. Okay, okay, pass test, okay, and don't know why the last one took so long. It seemed to be shorter, but you know how it is, how it is. Notification here. What's the notification? That's the worst notification in the history of notifications. That is it. That is literally it. I am going to do a snip. You know, just snip this to mark the fact to commemorate the fact that I've finished. The whole of MapReduce, including the optional task, which was half an hour of extra work, so sorry I did say I would end half an hour ago, but decided I may as well push it out. Um, yeah, just, I don't know. DS1, finished. Done the whole of MapReduce, it was a great introduction, and I'm looking forward to moving on to Raft. Glad I managed to bang everything out, literally. And 8 p.m. today. Chaz, refresh. Theo Croker. Still not that much of a fan of Theo Croker. But um, it's always good to challenge yourself. His song No Escape from Bliss, probably the, easily the best thing he's done in my eyes. But I mean, it's good. The rest of it's also good. It's just about taste. Test MR. 
MR challenge, which I edited slightly to go. I didn't touch any of the other folders, so I can just, yeah. As you can see, this, this is 100% MapReduce, the main folder, right? Now that I've cleared all of the legacy shit out of it, it just contains, you know, the routine for the inverted index, the word count, and those two binaries. These are the two sample outputs. This is the WC one, this is the II one. I don't know why they named them that stuff. Guy being lazy again. These are the input documents. And these are the test routines for II, for WC, and this is MR. Test the entire package, uh, MapReduce package, running the tests that are integrated into the test test of the package itself, plus the two past test things, which are just um, you know running those those uh, test scripts. Um, and that's it. Part one, okay. MapReduce cached because nothing changed. It just gave me a cached test result. Should be possible to run it without cache, but if nothing changed, that would also explain why it was so fast. I don't know. I mean, you're relying on the cache knowing what it's doing when it gives you a okay cached result. I mean, if I wanted to test without caching, I guess I could do that. I'll, I'll just give it a shot now. I have to jump back into the map reduced. Uh, directory. I can just I can just run go test, and it will run all of the tests. It also seems to be hella not caching this time around, and you know the the map reduce folder is going to be just exploding with files, and it's going to close as well and it says here pass and it, it's given me an actual time does not seem to be cached why why then was it caching here go test run sequential map produce I don't know I'll look into that a bit on the internet maybe later but it's not important everything works well, that's the main directory. MapReduce literally just contains the library now with the testing library as well. And the only changes that we made today, we did up schedule, we converted this, well, just changed the typo because I didn't like the look of it. It's not really a typo, it's just a style inconsistency. Brought II Go back from the dead and put in the actual content and changed this from CRLF to LF line ending. Done. Uh, what's going on here? Something's using up the. Never mind. That's it. Session seven ends. Map. Map reduce. Call it one map reduce. Complete. Capital complete. So I'm just feeling the hype. That's it. Uh, oh, I just control shift W, then that closed down Visual Studio code. I um, wanted to just sort of clean it up slightly before I uh, totally finish well. Oh yeah, I opened the wrong folder, sorry. Yeah, see, welcome. The source is just there for me. Oh, shit, open the wrong folder again. Yep, just clear that stuff out. So main and MapReduce, like I said, these are the two MapReduce directories. Main is now also entirely MapReduce stuff. So both of these will, for now on, be ignored in favor of other directories. You know, there, there's another seven directories to play around with for future projects, um, having done the optional one as well. Um, you know, these are the, the directories. I think they should all be visible when I do that. Shard master at the bottom. Yeah, that's it guys. Close. 
closing it all down. The sense of closure. So I'm just down to my streaming stuff now. Um, like I said, next session is not going to be scheduled for a while. Um, I'll post about it on Twitter, I think. My Twitter is the usual. Shout plenty. Twitter. Uh, when I start Raft. And yeah, pretty much it. I'll see if I can, you know, sort out some of the little technical problems that also keep coming back. But there's nothing, no, there's nothing else to say. I'm feeling pretty damn happy that it's all actually done. And I'm, yeah, I guess I'm sorry for dragging out my celebration, my chill vibe from finishing all of it. Zero dropped frames. Internet's good now that I've cabled it together. And yeah, we'll see how the stream progresses. Raft will also be streamed and I'll, you know, I'll see if I can make any changes. Don't know. Suggestions always welcome, obviously, if anyone happens to be watching. Which I can test now if I want to. Nah. No point watching this stuff because it's all finished. Cool. I did it. Map Produce is done. Raft is next. Coming back in about four or five days' time. Maybe a week, I don't know. See how it goes. And I'm out.